Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's Christian Church here in Raleigh. For those of you following me online, and for anyone who's a, a guest, we welcome you. Um, I am a teacher. Uh, my name is Michael Beadle. I am a teacher, and I go into schools uh, teaching creative writing. And this last week, I went into a school where they had uh, on the steps of the school different ways to say welcome. And I, I love lots of different words and lots of different ways to say things in different languages. I'm always trying to pick something up. So um, you might have heard of some of the ways to say welcome in different languages. Uh, in Spanish, bienvenidos. Uh, and in on French, it's sort of like that. It's bienvenue. Uh, in German, you might know that one. Willkommen. Uh, so I thought I'd, I'd teach a couple more to you. I didn't know if you knew these or not. This, this is one uh, from Arabic. Arabic, how to say welcome in Arabic. Ahlan Bika. Ahlan Bika. So now you know how to say welcome in, in Arabic. How about Swahili, a language that's spoken in uh, many countries in Africa? Karibu. Karibu. It almost looks like caribou when it's spelled out, but it's caribou. Good job. Good job. And lastly, uh, Japanese. This is yokosu. Yokosu. So now you know how to say uh, welcome in, in different ways. We try to welcome people not only into this space, but uh, when we're um, sharing uh, life with other people throughout the week. And we want to um, just encourage uh, folks who are coming here to be welcomed, and then to welcome others into our lives on a daily, a daily practice. So I ask that you stand, and we can uh, greet each other in, in many ways, but we can do this in song. So we can uh, sing a song that many of you may know. It's called Jesus Loves Me. It's found on 113, 113 in your hymnal. So let's sing Jesus Loves Me. Let us pray. Gracious God, creator of life and wonder, we come to you today with 
our aches and pains, with our busied minds, with heavy hearts for those we love and care about, those who are suffering. We come to you as imperfect people. For all we have failed to do, wanted to do, maybe didn't quite do right. But we know through your perfection, God, that you welcome us in all our imperfection. Help us, remind us that we are always welcome in the light of your love, your presence, that we may find the goodness in ourselves that you grant us. And in those words, Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good to be back with you after some time away. Megan and I enjoyed time with my family in the mountains last Sunday. It was a very rainy week, but it didn't keep the leaves from exploding with color. So we were thankful to witness that uh, this past week. At this time, I want to invite any of our toddlers or elementary age children um, to head to Worship and Wonder with our greeter, DJ, and her right-hand lady, Kate. Morning. Good morning. You've been hearing and reading now about the upcoming Prop Hunger Walk scheduled for Sunday, October 31st. As a continuing COVID-19 precaution, people will be walking in smaller groups, like here at St. Paul's, rather than the huge gatherings of past years. We work with Church World Service, raising money to reduce hunger and poverty all over the world. But 25% of those contributions helps nonprofit organizations right here in the tribe. One of those groups is Urban Ministries of Wake County. The 1981 brainchild of our own minister emeritus, Tom Law, a group of ministers of different faiths and denominations. It's grown from a soup kitchen, adding the ark shelter for men, then for women, then the open door medical clinic for uninsured adults. Most recently, the women's shelter, and you all know about this, it's now called the Helen Wright Center in honor of Sister Helen, the first director. It has expanded to a 73-bed facility that also offers counseling and classes to help with job readiness and life skills. Finally, the food pantry continues to provide a week's worth of groceries to more than 30,000 people each year. 
You can donate to CROP again this year by check or online through Simple Church or the link in the midweek email. You can also join our team and encourage your friends and relatives to offer support. Your contribution of any amount does make a big difference. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. We give thanks for Crop Walk and for all of the local and global organizations that this annual uh, fundraiser supports. As we enter into a time of prayer, we want to lift up Joom Siu and her family as they grieve the death of Joom's sister-in-law who passed away in Vietnam. I know many of our Montagnier families gathered yesterday um, to honor the life of her sister-in-law who they are grieving overseas. Also, as part of the Church Universal, um, I believe it's important for us to join our prayers with the devastating news that came out of France this past week. Um, for those of you who haven't heard, an investigation found that over the past 70 years, French clergy have abused over 200,000 kids. Um, there is no words in response to this horror, yet we must not ignore the history of abuse in churches and pray and work to make faith communities a place where all people are protected and cared for, especially the most vulnerable. Let us pray. Holy God, we come to you with thanksgiving and joy, with heavy burdens and worries, with confession and repentance. Week after week, God, we try to do our best to care for ourselves and those around us, to use our resources of time, treasure, and talent to meet the surging needs of our world, to love you with all of our heart, mind, and soul. This morning, we confess our sins of action and inaction. Forgive us, God, for our greed and gluttony, for our scarcity mindset that leads us to hoard and keep too much for ourselves when creatures near and far are in need. Teach us, God, to open our hands and hearts to practice radical generosity, to know what it is to need so we may experience your provision. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would be with Jum Siu and all those who grieve. Be with those who have lost loved ones years ago, yet continue to grieve. In moments of despair and loneliness, may we know your comfort. God, over the centuries, there have been many times when your church, a community that is called to stand against oppression and abuse, has been the very perpetrators of hatred. Comfort and heal those who have suffered. Convict your church and its leaders. When those who have been abused want nothing to do with the church that has harmed them, may they still know your love, which stands in opposition to any injustice. Holy God, guide us and empower us this week as we go about our days. In the face of indifference and self-interest, may we choose love and service of our neighbors. In Jesus' name, amen.
at the Run Club that Michael and I go to every week without fail. Before we start running, the organizer gathers everyone together and says, we don't care how fast you run. We don't care how far you run. We're just glad you're here. It seems like a small thing, but that one sentence sets the tone for the group. I've been to a lot of run clubs, and some of them really do only care about how fast or far you run. Uh, but this one is welcoming and friendly, no matter your pace. Everybody who has come just a few times knows to repeat that phrase. They can say it. It's part of the ethos of the group. Even though we show up to run or to walk, we keep coming back because it's a community of people that are happy to see us and we look forward to connecting with each other. At this table, the Lord's table, Jesus invites us to receive his love and forgiveness every week, telling us over and over again, I don't care what you've done or not done. I'm just glad that you're here. We don't have to prove we are worthy of being at this table. Jesus wants us to know that our presence matters. And he longs to connect with us over and over again. As a community of faith, we may come to this table for God's mercy, but I want to make sure we say to each other that it doesn't matter how long you've been part of this church. It doesn't matter what you carry with you, what secrets you hide, that we are glad you are here. Whether you're worshiping here in the sanctuary or virtually from home, your presence matters. Now let's share in this feast together as one community, glad to be God's body together. Let us pray. We thank you, our Father, that we may come as a family, literally and virtually, about this table. We thank you that Christ came not to condemn, but to save. In the bread and wine, grant us by faith to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Amen. Gathered with the disciples, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and broke it, saying, This is my body given for you. Every time you eat this, remember I am with you. Jesus also took the cup, saying, This is my love poured out for your forgiveness. Drink this and know you are loved and forgiven. Let us pray. Our Father, we have just humbly received the bread and cup, symbols of your greatest gift to us, the sacrificial gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We give thanks for all the blessings you have given us. We now offer freely our gifts of time and offerings and pray that you will lead us in using these to further your kingdom here on earth. Amen.
Today, we are beginning a short series on discipleship in the Gospel of Mark. The heart of Mark is full of passages about healing and welcoming children. So, to better understand how Jesus calls us to follow him, we're going to take a closer look at some of these stories and see what we can learn from the littlest ones among us about being faithful disciples. We often focus on what we as adults have to teach our children, but in the spirit of Jesus' teaching that the first shall be last, we'll set aside that perspective and try to see our faith through the eyes of a child. And to get us in that spirit, I'm going to share our scripture reading today as a worship and wonder story. Our text for today is Mark 9, verses 33 through 37. And um, if you don't know, worship and wonder is what our children do every Sunday when they leave here and go over to the Brown Building. Um, So we are going to get a little taste of their worship service. So we're going to start just like the kids do by singing a song that helps us get ready to hear God's message. Um, The song is called, Be Still and Know That I Am God. So if you know it, feel free to sing along, and the choir, I think, is going to help me out in singing it as well. Be still and know that This is the Sea of Galilee. So many things happen by the sea that we just have to have a small piece of it here to help us tell the stories. The sea is a wonderful and strange place. When the wind blows, the sea becomes rough and wild. And when the wind is calm, the sea is peaceful and still. Jesus and his disciples were returning to Capernaum. When they got home, Jesus asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But no one would answer. They had been arguing about who among them was the greatest. Then Jesus said, If you want to be the greatest, You must be last of all. If you want to be the greatest, you must be servant of all. Then he took a little child into his arms and said, 
whoever welcomes a child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but God who sent me. I wonder how the child feels in Jesus' arms. I wonder how the disciples feel about what Jesus said. I wonder how welcoming a child is like welcoming Jesus. We might hear this story and wonder what church would not want to welcome children, right? Most churches are eager to have thriving youth programs in which children are a vital part of the church. And so when we hear these words of Jesus today, for many of us, they don't really sound like a challenging call to discipleship but something that we are eager to strive for, right? We want those sounds in our church. We like having children around. But to the first disciples, this would have been a surprising idea. Children in Jesus' time weren't delighted in and adored like they are today. In that time, a child was seen as more of a liability, um, who had little influence or honor because they weren't yet contributing to the household. So they were considered and fed last, like the servants. They were kept in the background. In the original Greek, those listening would have made the connection between the word for little child, padian, and a similar Greek word for servant, peis. In the ancient world of Jesus' time, offering hospitality was very important. And there were particular ways that you showed just how important a guest was by the kind of welcome you offered them. It would have sounded ridiculous to Jesus' followers that they should treat a little child the same way they would treat an honored guest. And even though today our affection for little children may be a lot greater, I think we can still learn from Jesus' words. Even though we want children and families in our church, we often structure our worship and our programs in ways that feel more welcoming to those of us who are in charge than to those who have little influence or status. We do this not necessarily because we don't want to welcome people with less influence, but because we are just so used to doing things the way that we always have, the way that makes sense to us, that we might have a hard time knowing what it looks like to do anything different. We don't realize that some of the things we take for granted might feel inhospitable to someone with different needs than ours. Most churches and most worship services are created to make those who are already there feel comfortable. Here in this service, we often organize our worship to prioritize quiet reverence, time to sit still and reflect and focus on listening for long periods of time, like you're listening to me, I could just keep talking all day and you'd sit here and listen, right? 
<laughs> in order to follow along with the bulletin and the hymns, it helps if you are proficient at reading English. Children Worship and Wonder is a worship service that is designed specifically for children to make them feel welcome, to help them worship and connect to God in age-appropriate ways. It draws on all of their senses and is interactive and uses words and actions that make sense to them. To set aside that time and space is as sacred and different from other places, they take off their shoes as they go into the worship and wonder room. They have special floor mats that they sit on. The Bible story is shared using those simple figures that help them visualize the story, but still leave room for them to use their imagination. And after they hear the scripture or the story for the day, they respond to it in a tactile way. They can draw or paint or use Play-Doh to recreate the story, or they can reenact it with the figures that the storyteller used. Children even serve as the diaconate and all the other roles in worship, taking turns to pass out the feast, which is their version of communion with graham crackers and juice, and they collect the trash afterwards. It is a full worship service, but with every element designed so that kids can participate, even ones as young as three years old. Imagine with me for a minute what this worship service and what this space might look like if we planned worship with children as the main guests, as the main focus. Maybe instead of pews, there would be a big open area with pillows and bean bags and ball pits and sandboxes, maybe even some swings and hammocks, places where you could sit and it wouldn't matter if you got a little wiggly and fidgety. The service might be more interactive. Maybe learning about the scripture would involve making art or reenacting the story with each other or building big Lego towers. It kind of sounds fun, doesn't it? <laughs> Reimagining church as a place that's more child-centered is one way that we could apply Jesus' teachings from Mark to our own time on a very literal level. But I don't think that Jesus was only talking about children. They were just an effective example from his time and culture about how we welcome those who are not often given places of privilege and honor. If we look around our own community, there might be people who feel like church is not designed to make them feel at home. We're so conditioned by our own experience of church, it can be hard for us to realize what it might feel like to show up as someone whose appearance or abilities or language, someone whose financial situation, gender identity, sexuality, family circumstances, or life circumstances are outside of the church's norm. A person who uses a wheelchair might come in and wonder where they should sit. A single dad might wonder if he'll be able to find a bathroom where he has a changing station for his daughter's diaper. The mother of an autistic teen might wonder how people will respond when her son's comments disrupt the prayers or the sermon, or how he will fit in with the youth group activities. A gender non-binary person might wonder how they could lead or connect when they find that we have gender-specific deacons and deaconesses, or when they don't quite know whether they should go to the men's group or the women's group. A veteran who uses his service dog to calm his PTSD might wonder if people will talk about him behind his back because he doesn't go anywhere without his pets, or wonder why he insists on always sitting in the back row near the door. 
Jesus calls us not just to tolerate or accept people whose needs aren't usually considered, but to welcome them with open arms, to think about how we might need to change in order to be a place of gracious welcome. Even though Jesus himself enjoyed some degree of privilege in his society as a Jewish male, he tried to see things from the point of view of people who were considered outsiders and to treat them as VIPs among his own followers. Jesus not only welcomed children, but women of questionable morality, tax collectors, lepers, Samaritans, anyone who society viewed as the last. Jesus treated as if they were the first. Jesus calls his followers to put ourselves in the shoes of those who need, whose needs aren't usually made the priority. Instead of striving to be the greatest, instead of expecting our needs and comfort to be put first, faithful discipleship means seeing the world from the perspective of the servant of all, the one who is last to be shown hospitality and doing what it takes to make that person feel like an honored guest, to treat that person as if Jesus himself has shown up in our midst. In Worship and Wonder, after the storyteller finishes sharing the day's story, they always end by asking some open-ended wondering questions. And the children can choose to answer them out loud or just to sit and think about them silently. They're questions meant to inspire deeper reflection on the story, not ones that have a right or wrong answer. Questions like, I wonder, who besides children Jesus would tell us to welcome today? who are not often honored or valued in our society. I wonder how we might change how we do things in order to be more welcoming of people whose needs aren't often considered. I wonder if it would make us uncomfortable to change how we do things in order to be more welcoming. Amen. Before we sing our closing hymn, I have a few announcements for our community. Um, following worship this afternoon from 12.30 to 2.30, we are hosting our annual flu shot clinic partnered with Walgreens. Um, if you were interested in receiving your shot after service but haven't signed up, we have a few more slots left. So just talk with Diane or I or the Fairchilds after service and we can help get that squared away. If you are getting your shot, a reminder to bring your health insurance card. And if you don't have health insurance, we have vouchers to cover the cost. There are also two invitations to save the date and help out around St. Paul's. Um, on Saturday, October 23rd, so two weeks from yesterday, we are going to have a fall property work day from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. We will be sending out a list of projects in this week's midweek email so you can review those and see if there's something that you feel like you have the skills or energy to help with. Um, we would appreciate all hands on deck to care for our campus that day. Um, and then I have an update from Elaine Weirchuk about the yard sale. Um, so the y actual yard sale, as we may remember it, is going to be postponed until spring. However, on the weekend of November 5th and 6th, there will be a mini version in the form of an estate sale, so bigger pieces 
of furniture and things like that. Um, so you can talk uh, to Elaine, text, email for more information. If you have some items you would like to donate, if you have tents or canopies to help us set up outside, um, or if you'd like to volunteer that weekend of November 5th and 6th. So we'll send out more information, um, but that's just a quick update. And there are many other opportunities to grow and connect with others this week. Um, Ruth and Esther Circle are meeting on Tuesday. We have virtual adult Bible study and youth group on Wednesday. Um, and our in-person Bible study will meet Thursday morning. So we hope you find some way to connect with others and grow spiritually this week. Now I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn, number 431. you to join me in reading our benediction found in your bulletin or on the screen. Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. Let us go. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come here. Believe the good news. Go in peace. Amen.